All right, it is two o'clock. Um, people are still logging in, but we know how busy you guys are as nonprofit fundraisers. We want to respect your time, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Just before um, we do get started, I have a couple housekeeping notes, and I wanted to introduce myself to you since you will hear my voice. My name is Abby Jarvis. I work over at QGive. Um, I know some of you are QGive users. Hello, if you're not a QGive user, um, we're an online fundraising platform, and we get super stoked about anything that will help nonprofit fundraisers raise more money. Um, and that's why we're so excited to talk to John today. Um, he's not going to talk about online fundraising necessarily, but he is going to talk about some other fundraising activities that are probably even more important than online, uh, which is a big deal for me to say. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar, so you will get a copy of the webinar recording itself to your inbox along with a number of other resources that relate to what we talk about today. Um, you'll get that from me, what's today, Tuesday, probably tomorrow or Thursday. Um, and in the meantime, I did include the Twitter handles for John and the Agents of Good and QGive. So if you just absolutely can't wait for more awesome reading, check out these Twitter handles. There are tons of fantastic resources there that you can learn from. Um, with us today is John Lepp, who is one of the original Agents of Good. He and his business partner, Jen, are nonprofit consultants that focus on championing donors and telling stories that inspire those donors to act. Um, he has a ton of fantastic insight into how we can inspire our donors every day, and I am so excited that you all get to hear from him. Um, John, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. I am excited about this presentation since you told us on Twitter that you were going to blow our minds with what you have to say. It's not to, to oversell it, but I hope I hope some minds are blown today. <laughs> that would be that would be lovely if I could do that. So yeah, I've got a bit of content I need to fly through here, so I'm gonna get going if that's all right. Thanks, Abby. Thanks for the intro. So thank you and welcome to coming. Thank you for coming to Don't Love Forever in a Day. And let me just Okay, cool. Um, the objective of this presentation is to explore the crucial donor connection between annual giving and legacy giving. So we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about how these two things, of course, overlap. But first, anyone who's ever seen me present before knows that every time I do a presentation, I start with talking about our donors. And this is Dale, and Dale is your donor. And she's in her 70s currently, and she gives single gifts to about maybe 30 of you. Um, she might be a monthly donor to about five others. And back in the 40s and her 40s or 50s, she would have been making her first will, um, but she'll change her will to include organizations like yours when she gets closer to, to 80. And really for us in our work, it's all about her. It's all about Dale and the conversations we're blessed to have with her every single day. And in the context of this presentation, it's important to note that Dale is loyal, but she probably isn't rich. And why that matters is because we've all seen the traditional donor pyramid. And most people that I find who are responsible for legacy fundraising tend to be the same people who are responsible for major gifts. And obviously, if you work in major gifts, you know it forces you to focus on where the big gifts will come from right now, today. But this is where most of your legacy gifts are going to come from tomorrow. So you can see where these two roles can deviate. Most of your legacy gifts will come from your minor donors. That's the 80% of the donor file that tends to get ignored by most organizations. And a well-executed legacy program very quickly can out start to outpace almost any major gift program. I'll say that one more time. A well-executed legacy program can quickly outpace almost any major gift program. And I'll show you why. In the United States, I won't usually ask when I'm in a room if anyone knows how many organizations you have in the United States. Last time I heard, you have close to 1.4 million charities and not-for-profits all competing for the same amazing, loving donors like Dale. And so much of it really ends up looking and looking like this. Uh, of course, like Abby said, I'm in Canada. Dale in Canada will get between 30 to 40 appeals in a very busy week. In the United States, where you guys are, where a lot of you are, she can get between 40 and 50 appeals in one day. 
And that's why donor love is so important because it can be a serious competitive advantage by doing lots of simple things. United States, again, I usually ask the question if anyone knows what the average bequest size, what the average gift size a donor will leave in their will to an organization. In the United States, the last time I heard that number was $32,000. Just for some comparisons, these numbers are in American dollars, but these are a couple Canadian organizations uh, that we're friends with, and you can see what their average bequest size tends to be, so it skews a bit higher. Um, again, just for a bit more context, you can see what the average Stone Canada is a bit lower. In the UK and Australia, you can see is a bit higher than we are here. But they've been working on their legacy programs for quite some time now. Uh, they're a lot more mature than, say, some of our programs are, which is why I think we see the big difference. And so Canada and the United States were really, really trailing in this area in terms of talking to donors and having these really important conversations. So everyone loves math. Uh, every person I've ever met at any organization loves to punch numbers on their uh, computers and their laptops and their calculators because math proves everything, doesn't it? So a little math game I have here is who wants $19 million? I don't have to see any of you face to face to know that everyone is sitting at their desk uh, and raising their hands right about now. We would all love to have $19 million. So how do you get $19 million? So this is the game, this is the scenario. Let's assume that yours is a smaller charity and you have about 6,000 active donors. Again, this math will work no matter how many active donors you have, so you can play with this math to see what your number would be. By 2021, you could potentially, two years from now, not even, you could potentially be starting your annual budget process with about a million dollars per year of unrestricted income from legacies. And that's because tomorrow, Day after today, when you go back to your desk and back to your office, you went back and you started to invest in a strategic, ongoing, donor-loving legacy program. So how do we get to that math? Well, if you have 6,000 active donors, 2% of those with the right conversation will become legacy donors. So that's 120 people. You have another 5% which will become legacy prospects. So that's about 300 people and 10% of those prospects will actually convert into legacy donors, so that's 30. So 120 donors plus 30 prospects, that gives you 150 legacy donors if you start to have the right conversation with them right away. And also, for every one legacy donor tells you that left a gift in their will, there's gonna be four more who will never tell you, they will just show up. So if you have 150, actually you have about 600 legacy donors. And then when you start to look at the average legacy gift of $32,000, that equals $19.2 million. And that money will start to come in about two years from now, from about 2021 to 2040, there will be a rising income from legacies as these boomers move onto the great beyond, wherever that might be. So it's definitely not a bad place to start your budget planning in the years ahead. Again, the math, this math, math exercise is fun. And again, I know we all love to play with math. We can do it, but let's not forget one thing, that donor love is all about our beloved donor, Dill. And like we say over here, how rich she is, is none of our business. Our job is to take care of her the best we can every single day. So we use these principles to guide us in our work every single day. And again, I've used these principles, which some of you may have heard before, um, for this presentation to sort of break down the content. And the principles that we use in our work is your donors are heroes, and our job is to share amazing and inspiring stories with them. We have to connect to their values and emotions. We have to remind ourselves that donor love is actually a courtship. It is a romance. How do you make your donor fall and stay in love with you? In the context of your annual giving or your giving in general, only ask for one thing and only one thing. Who or what is the right voice for your story? And donor love is all the small things all the time. And most importantly, you say thanks with passion. A lot of people think donor love is just about the thanks part, saying thanks with passion, but I'm gonna show you why it's actually a whole lot more than that. So let's dive in. Principle one, your donors are heroes. Your charity is a vehicle for your donor to do something they care deeply and passionately about. They care about your cause and they want to take action for what they believe in. Your donors want to help you. They actually want to fix something. And they definitely want to make an impact and feel really good about it. 
Tom Hearn, this is a picture of Tom uh, at a presentation. He says, I want to read about me, the donor, not you, the organization. So we always suggest using Tom's red pen test. Anytime the word you appears in any form, yours, you'll, you circle it in red. You is the most important and powerful word in fundraising. It keeps your donors involved. So here's an example of that. This is an annual appeal uh, piece that we did for a food bank here in Canada. And this was the other envelope uh, that we sent to donors. You can see it's not a white number 10 envelope. It's a larger nine by six envelope. And we just did a simple two page letter and we'll just take a quick look at it here. And you can see from our red, red pen test, it's successful. There's lots of U's, lots of things a donor can make possible. And the ask is very straightforward. We're making it very clear that if you can give, you'll be our hero today. Even the reply form, very straightforward. We almost always use a full size reply form. And again, notice the language. You'll rescue fresh food. You'll feed hungry kids. You'll help neighbors. You can be our hero. Another sort of very obvious example of how you can make the donor the hero of every single thing you do. Your donors, they are the actual heroes and you have to celebrate them. And when you make them the star of your work, amazing things will happen. Principle two, you connect to your donor's values and emotions. One of the most important lessons we ever learned in this sector is that money follows value. In the context of your organization, 24 hours before you were founded, a bunch of restless people probably got together and they insisted on action. They had to do more for something that they believed in. Human rights, social justice, saving the environment, the health of our loved ones. These aren't transactions. These are the things that define us as human beings. And they speak to our core values and we're emotionally connected to these things. So some examples. This is a list of core personal values. Ask yourself, what are the values that your charity reflects and embodies? For example, if your Habitat for Humanity, it could be collaboration, hard work, respect. If you're the YMCA, it could be confidence, health, leadership, well-being. If you're WWF, it could be nature, future generations, conservation. Tell stories that connect to your shared values and demonstrate how your donor's gifts will put those values into action. So the question is, how do we actually do that in your appeals? Here's an example of an appeal that we did for a spring campaign we worked with, uh, with Ontario Nature, the, of course, an environmental organization here in Ontario. And the campaign was about save, saving a piece of land only accessible by boat. And this campaign obviously is deeply connected to the value of conservation, a value of the organization, of course, and the donor, of course, holds very dear to their heart. And so what we did was we took a look at the letter um, that Jen wrote, and every single paragraph touches on and utilizes a value and emotion, all of which probably echo the donors. Have you ever gone through any of your own appeal letters and looked at them like this? Do your appeal letters have an emotional range, just like you know we do in real life conversation every single day? Take a closer look at yours. And I'm sure you're wondering, you know, how do you find these amazing donors? I just showed you an annual example. Those are donors you already have. But in the context of legacy giving, how do you find these people who are thinking of or have actually already left a gift in their will to you? Let's take a look at a couple examples. This is a DM piece, again, for the same organization, Ontario Nature. And this went out to their annual donors. And this was like imitation size, and this should be very different and should feel very different than your annual appeals. This legacy letter is long, it's four pages, and it opens getting the reader thinking about the last time nature took your breath away. Again, I went through and highlighted the mix of value, values and emotions that we used in this appeal letter. And Caroline Eady talks about the values and the importance of always having Ontario nature protecting the wild spaces and wild species we love the most. And we include this timeline, uh, very different than the usual really boring organizational timelines, 
Um, this includes the shared victories and dreams for the future. So me, the donor, is reflecting on the story of my life. It's connecting the activity of this charity to the anchors or milestones of my own life. And of course, we include this survey that allows people to tell us a little more about themselves as well as uh, let them, if they want to, indicate that they've left a gift in their will to this organization. Here's another example from across the pond. This is from our, my friend Mark Phillips of Blue Frog UK. And this is an example that they worked on for Rethink Mental Illness. Um, and Rethink wanted to run a campaign to find new legacy donors. And this was outside of their annual program. Uh, this was sort of going out to the public to sort of find some new donors. And so what they did was they ran some ads, they called them press ads uh, in the newspaper, and they included this cutout reply form uh, that you could request some more information about leaving a gift um, to the organization. And press ads are very common in, in the UK where I don't think anyone really uh, that I know of is doing them pretty much in Canada or the, the US. They also tested and ran a few different ads on Facebook um, which was pretty interesting. They tested different taglines, different visuals to sort of see, and those people who are working in digital space know that you can do this stuff a lot easier and quicker than you can in, say, the print, print space. So, Abby, here is some digital content just for you. And if you clicked on any of these Facebook ads, you would go through to a web page where you could click a button to get, uh, to get a guide or ask for a guide to leaving a gift in your will. Um, there was also some uh, space in here for you to type out your own message about why mental illness was important to me. And those people who are requesting the information would get a pack like this. And of course, it had a letter, it had a card, it had a number of different items. But in the middle, you can see the blue guide, which was the guide to the information about why you should leave a gift to this organization. So in the UK, every single will that is that is written or is, you know goes goes into a public record. So they have people who can actually go in and collect data from humans, people's wills, which is really interesting. And so in this case, they knew that every year 555 gifts were left in wills to mental health causes of all types. 555. Through this campaign, they found a total of 545 new potential legacy donors for this one organization. That's incredible. And 75% of those came from those press ads, which means you had close to 450 come through Facebook. I know a lot of fundraisers poo-poo fundraising, fundraising on Facebook, but you can see in some cases you can actually make it work. I think this is really super cool because there's no one over here at all who's doing work in this space. Uh, and so you, again, are at advantage if you start to think about how can we utilize these different channels. Here's another example. So this is a, an example of a DRTV ad, and some people aren't used to the uh, what DRTV actually means is direct response television. DRTV used to be very common, still is pretty common in the U.S., but not a lot of people are using it um, for legacy, finding new legacy donors. Um, it's really, really cool because in the U.S. and in Canada, you can do regional television. So you can do an ad like this. And if you want certain people in a certain city center to only see it, you can make sure that it's only broadcast in that area. So that's super cool. Um, DRTV is going to be monumental in the next few years for organizations who are trying to find new legacy donors.
And I'm sure a lot of you are told to use a templated eight and a half by three and a half brochure, which I'm sure covers the nuts and bolts of legacy giving. And maybe that will do, um, I, it won't, but maybe for you it, it might. But as I'm sure you're starting to understand, you have to move way beyond that and quickly. Because if you think that one tiny brochure will do it, will find you all these amazing donors, it won't, I promise you. And if you think a nice direct mail piece will do it, it probably won't either. I mean, these donors might not even be getting their mail anymore, but we do know that online and Facebook are working. And like I said, the first organizations to really utilize DRTV and having these conversations with donors uh, will win for sure. So I hope you'll think about using some of these other channels uh, to start to find these people who want to leave a gift to you in their will. Principle three, you share amazing and inspiring stories. You have these amazing stories swirling around you every single day. You have these stories of the things your donor makes possible. You have these stories about problems they can help solve. And in the context of your legacy program, you can actually share the stories of the donors themselves. And so this is a piece that we create. It's called the Y brochure. This goes to donors who have raised their hand, saying they are thinking about leaving a gift in their will or already have. And they'll get a piece like this. And it does answer the question, why leave a legacy gift to us? And a piece like this should share the amazing and inspiring stories of donors who've left a gift to the organization in their will. And just to point out, this isn't a small eight and a half by three and a half trifold brochure. I, we wanted this piece to look like a curated field guide. This is for Ontario Nature. If you're an Ontario Nature member or donor, you know what this thing is that you're looking at. You have a field guide of your own at home. This is something that resonates with donors and again, made sense in the context of the organization. And we filled it with sketches and clippings, type notes, and the personal stories of donors who have left a gift in their will to Ontario Nature. These were people's lives, their stories, their dreams, their wishes. And we include a promise to donors about what being a part of the Legacy Society meant and a personal promise to the donor about the care they would receive as part of the society. And it closed out with a letter from Caroline about the legacy vision, what their vision was for the future. There weren't any boring checklists. This didn't deep dive into the transactional aspect of leaving a gift in your will. So many of these things do. Our job is to hold a mirror up to Dale. It's to show her how people like her who have, done, who have done this amazing thing, and she can do it too. She'll be nodding along as she reads their stories and hears the echo of them in her heart. We share a story, there's a story called The Three Deaths. Um, it's from this book called um, Some, The 40 Tales from the Afterlives. Uh, you can see down there in the corner. The story of The Three Deaths is this, is that you know our first death is when the breath leaves our bodies for the last time. That's our first death. The second death is when we're lowered into the ground. And the third death is when our name is spoken for the last time for the rest of eternity. So in the context of your donor, we have the beautiful privilege of extending their third and final death because their name is spoken with reverence and devotion by anyone who reads or hears their story. And that's a really beautiful thing. Principle four. It's a courtship, a romance. How do you make your donor fall and stay in love with you? This is what we call our donor love story grid. It maps out all the touch points between you and your donors or your community. And it's anchored around feelings. And we develop these things, these donor love stories for every type of donor, including legacy donors. We want to think about this conversation. And again, in the conversation, in the, the, in the context of the fact that some of these donors can be with you for another 10, 15, 20 years before they actually pass away. This is a long relationship. This is a long conversation. You need to be thinking about this. So in the context of your unit program, here are some things that we do. You know, the first bit of love, a donor should feel 
shouldn't be that stupid soul destroying transactional thank you letter that was written 16 years ago and no one thinks about anymore. This is an example of a thank you card we created for a client that sent out with a handwritten thank you within 48 hours of getting a gift from a donor. The receipt can follow later on. Getting to know you is so important in the context of donor love. How do you let your donors talk to you? What can you do to create softer ways to, to invite your donors to tell you their stories? This was for a holiday appeal where donors could send back a very simple paper ornament to patients or the doctors or nurses at this hospital. We go all over the United States and I ask people all the time, how many people are doing things like this in their annual program? How often are you letting your donors tell you their stories, share things that are important to them with you? And I've yet to go into a room and anywhere in the US and find a person raise their hand. And that is a massive problem. We need to start doing better at letting our donors talk to us. Surprising and delighting donors is so simple and easy. Adding a photograph to your mailing showing a value in, in action is simple and it's effective. In this case, the client took the image down to a local photography store and got duplicates made to drop into the envelopes of valued donors. And donors rarely ever get to see anything like this. Another donor love story device we've de developed but don't see very often is this annual update on key accomplishments. Last year, because of you, we were able to accomplish one, two, and three things. And in the coming year, we know because you'll be along us, alongside, we'll be able to, to affect, you know, take action on these three things or whatever it might be. It's very simple. And this is content you already have sitting around your office. It's very easy to pull together and put into a DM pack. How can you demonstrate impact in a bigger sort of way? You know, my joke is, yes, you can let your marketing and comms department design a gorgeous looking annual report with lots of boring abstract images and probably adheres to your soul destroying graphic standards, or you can actually craft a gratitude report, a piece that pours donor love syrup all over your donors and tells them the amazing stories of their hard work. This is an example from the Alzheimer's Society out in Nova Scotia, not too far from our friends in New Brunswick that are here today. And this piece, we talked to Kalina and David, we heard their story, and we wanted to tell it in a beautiful hand curated photo album. And that was the right way to tell this story. It has nothing to do with your brand standards. Another example. Hi, my name is Brian Wolf. We're here today at Altberg Wetlands, updating our species inventory and monitoring vegetation changes. Wetlands are home to many species of birds and snakes and reptiles, such as the Eastern Garter Snake. Um, we just want to take the time to thank you for being a member and supporting this work. Every single person I can bet listening to this webinar today is either holding in their hand at this very moment a little thing called a phone. And these phones allow us to go out and actually record simple videos from the field of program people doing important work that our donors would love to see. This piece is very low tech, very simple, but it has high impact, again, because your donors never get to see any of these things. So think about your donor love story. Think about how can you reach out and touch your donors in very simple ways and show them emotionally the impact of their giving, and again, to continue that conversation all year long. Principle five, you ask for one thing and only one thing. Uh, there's a old colleague of ours named George Smith. Um, George Smith is no longer with us, but 1995, he wrote a book that you should try to find out, find if you can, it's called Asking Properly. And in this book, it's full of gems um, that are now more than 20 years old. But one of the things he says is every single appeal you should send to donors should be special. And what that means is, and I'll cover all that means, but basically means asking for a single thing. So this is a pack we did for Camp Ooch, and this appeal was to help send kids with cancer to camp this summer. It's a mouthful. And it went out in a nine by six outer envelope. Um, so it stands out again from all the white number tens that your donors mostly are getting. And even you can tell by looking at the outer envelope, it's playful, it's visually interesting, and it certainly asks more questions than provides answers. And down on the bottom corner of the back of the envelope, which says, camp is right this way. I think your donor's intrigued by this, and they want to find out what, what is camp is right this way, what's going on? So when they get to the letter, it's very simple from the ED, and it can be summed up in one paragraph. The Alex ED says, 
This every gift today will help send more kids like Matthew to camp this summer. Asking for one thing. And you can do more than just using photographs. Photographs, especially the stock ones, are seen all the time, all over the place. So we create lots of illustrations on occasion for our clients. And this was a playful map because we wanted to bring donors closer to the impact of their gift. We wanted to bring them inside a camp, the camp on a way they've never sort of seen before. And on the back, we went in some more detail about some of the cool spots around the campground that, that kids would find. And finally, we created two more um, inserts, and they were from the beneficiaries, Anna and her son, Matthew. And so the first was an insert from Matthew's mom, and it was designed to look like a diary entry, and it contains human touches all over it. There's little paper clips and hand underwriting, smiley faces, and it dove into the story of Matthew from his mom's perspective. Her words really inspired so much of our appeal. And the other insert was from Matthew, and it was in his own words and what going to camp meant to him. These pieces may seem like overkill and unnecessary, but your donors get to hear many different perspectives on why their giving matters, and they do affect the overall response in the average gift in a positive way. Uh, most people rely on just doing a letter and a reply form in a BRE. We can go a lot further than that, and we should be. And finally, this is the reply form. The front of the coupon or reply form was personalized and the gift array was relevant and appropriate to the donor. It included space for a heartfelt message that donors could send back. And on the back, we include some very specific examples of what $50 would do or what $4,000 would do. When you can be specific, it will also increase your response rate and your average gift because donors for a change actually know what their money is going to do. So often they have no idea why you're asking them for $50. Every single appeal that you do, whether that's online or offline, should be as specific as possible in what you're asking donors for and what you want them to do and what their giving will do. We also got some pieces like this back, again, that letting your donors talk to you. And this piece says, Dear Camp Boochers, as you enter the magical realm of Camp Booch this summer, may your bodies experience the aches of too much. Belly aches from laughing too much, face aches from smiling so much, and arms ache from hugging all of your new and old friends. Have a super fantastic adventure at Camp Ooch. How beautiful is this? I love it. This donor is giving with love in her heart and a large smile on her face. Unbelievably, in the context of this appeal, about 65% of the donations came back with feelings just like this. I mean, you wanna talk about engagement and you wanna talk about donor love. This is it right here, guys. Donors had never heard from Camp Ooch this way before, nor had they received such a creative look at the impact of their giving. This appeal had a 30% increase in gifts. It had a jump of 40% in the revenue. And the average gift went up over 200%. That is extraordinary, but it really does speak to the magic of Camp Ooch and of course, the generosity of its donors. But why is it we see so many reply forms that look like this? I know you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, mine looks like this. Does it? Take a closer look at yours. Count out, how many decisions does my donor have to make to fill out this reply form completely. In the context of this small one, this eight and a half by three and a half one, this one has 27 decisions I actually have to make to fill it out completely, including a legacy ask. Is this really the time or place to start this most important conversation? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no, it's not. It's not the right place at all. Principle six, who or what is the right voice for your story? Again, our pal George Smith, Back, this is, again, more than 20 years ago, he was saying this, so much fundraising is now formulaic that the merest adventure, the smallest piece of pioneering will stand out from the crowd. That's even more true than it was 20 years ago. One way you can create a compelling ask is using an unexpected voice. We always ask, take the time to ask the question, who or what is the right voice for this story? And more importantly, who is the right voice in the eyes and ears of your donor? So here's an example we have to share. 
And this is a piece, again, we did for Terry Nature a couple of years ago now. And this is what the other envelope looked like. Yes, it's a white number 10 envelope, but it's a little bit different than standard envelope. What's going on here? You can see there's these prints or something in the top left-hand corner. If you're a bird nerd, and most Ontario Nature members are bird nerds, they know exactly what that is. And they know it's a print of a hummingbird. And so the letter came from our friend, Ruby the Hummingbird. And there's a photograph of a Ruby at the top and says a shot of taken of me just before we lost, left Costa Rica, it's my good side. I'll read a little bit up to you. It says, dear Jen, I bet you've never received a letter from a bird before, but that's okay. I've never written a letter before. Caroline Schultz and the team at Ontario Nature wanted you to hear my story from my point of view and what a journey it was for me this year. I just arrived back home here in Ontario's spectacular boreal forest after my annual 4,500 kilometer migration from Costa Rica. Even the back, Ruby shares the problem in an unexpected way. He says, what, what, what was that? I thought I saw another ruby throated hummingbird right in front of me and as I skirted left, so did he. And I skirted right and so did he. I hovered and so did he. I was looking at me and there was a monstrous, monstrous structure, clearly like a window right in front of me. I flew straight up until the strange image was gone and I continued. I know now what that was. That was the deadliest building for birds in Toronto. To us birds, it's a wall of windows right on the shore of a path that we all take to get home to the boreal forest and we can't see it. Ruby can capture the story, the drama, the villainy, so much more um, more effective than we can um, through our own eyes. And that's why it works. And so we included this insert from Caroline D.D. And yes, Caroline lets in that the fact that yes, you've got you've never gotten a, a letter from a bird before, but that's okay because what we have here is a big problem. Um, but fortunately, Ontario Nature has a solution, and you, our beloved donor, can help us. And we include this map just again to illustrate the point in a totally different way. Um, we, Jen mostly believes that donors love maps, but donors do love to see a visual look at the problem and how that can be a part of the solution. The cool thing with things like this is when we use these more creative voices for appeals is you get interesting things happening that you can't always count on. Count on. And so after the pack went out, we got this back. This was from a donor named Jack. Uh, Gingrich, I won't read the whole letter. Um, I'm, I'll just read a little bit of it because he says, Dear Ruby, you win the bet. I have indeed never received a letter from a bird, not even from a cute young chick, and I'm thrilled and delighted. I hope you won't send any letters to glowworms because they don't want to be delighted. I can't think of any other species of birds that I would rather receive a letter from. I certainly would not like to receive a letter from a vulture. The, this letter is filled with so many puns, like down the PS, he says, why did it not say air mail on your envelope? PS number two, when a male hummingbird performs in semicircular swinging from side to side, do you call him a real swinger? You know, Jack was full of jokes and puns. It was brilliant. Um, and so when you get something like this, of course, Ruby had to write back to Jack after he took the time to write her, didn't he? And he did. So again, I won't read you all the letter. If you actually want to, this is my opportunity for a shout out for this amazing website um, called Sophie, S-O-F-I-I.org, the showcase of fundraising, innovation, inspiration. Um, and sh the Sophie includes this whole example as a case study on the website. And Sophie's brilliant because it has tons of different types of examples of, of so many different types of fundraising. It's got white papers, it's got book reviews, it's got everything. I would suggest you check it out, um, even at the very least, just to check out this, this appeal a little closer. Um, this, uh, this example that I've just used of Ruby, is it's a fun example, and we know it's been copied a number of times by other organizations through the years with similar effect, which is donors really uh, getting behind it and with their, with their wallets and with their uh, hearts. Um, so again, if you have a chance, check it out on Sophie. Um, it had been a while since the appeal went out. Jack, uh, who wrote to Ruby, continues to give every year. He's also told Ontario Nature that he has remembered them in his will. And so uh, last year for Christmas, what we did is we commissioned an artist to create a, a Ruby illustration. And Ruby, of course, wrote back to Jack one more time. And uh, here's, our, here's our pal Jack, uh, bless him, uh, with his card and his new artwork. You know, can you do things like this for every single donor? No, you you can't. Of course you can't. But you can do them for your best donors. And that's what we're asking for is these people really are some of your best donors. What can you do uh, to reach out and touch them in this, this sort of way? Think about that. 
Principle seven, flying right along here. Donor love is all the small things all the time. I want to share with you how small and mostly human things add to a unique and personal experience for your donor. So important, this is so important. Our pal Frankie um, worked at UNICEF in Italy, and um, Frankie was the director of development there. And he shared two small things that he did uh, in his uh, donor love department. That's what he actually called it. Um, and he did the most easy, two most low-tech things I could think of. One is he made sure every donor got a card, a handwritten card, within 48 hours of a gift. And every single year, they would call up these donors just to say, we know a year ago you gave to us, and that's amazing. Thank you so much. These two things, these two things alone, on top of everything else that we've talked about, these two things, he could see a 30% yearly increase in the retention of those donors and saw a 50% increase in lifetime value. Again, I won't ask the question because I can't see anyone raise their hand, but I really ask who in this seminar can't do these two simple things? For your best donors, can you do this for everybody? Well, if you're a monster, monster charity, that might be a little beyond your realm of uh, possibilities, but I think that most you could find ways to make sure you could do this for the bulk of your, your donors. Another example, this is from my pal, uh, Simon, uh, who hopefully is on the call today. Um, you know, he says, like, if you have people calling your donors, don't let them say something like this. We're just reaching out to all of our donors today. Dale should feel like you were just sitting there at your desk doing your work and she popped into her head and you decided to write her a letter or pick up the phone and call her. She needs to feel special. It's just a small little change of phrasing, but so important. We do things like this in our appeals all the time. Highlighting, handwriting, courier type, notes in the margin, stars, arrows, handwriting. Talk about sticky notes, real photographs, paper clips. These are all things that computers don't do very well, but humans do. Um, we create inserts and grad to reports all the time that look hand curated, imperfect, on purpose. Um, this, again, another joke, again, hopefully Simon's laughing to himself right about now. Uh, this is a letter from Simon when he was the, the donor and head of fundraising at this organization in, in Ireland. And we always joke with Simon that he thinks he's uh, Bono, but he's obviously not Bono. Don't let your ED write their name like this, like they're a rock star. This is a small, tiny thing that sends a message to your donor that they're not important enough for you to take your time to write your name up properly. Small thing, but massively important. Another small way you can show donors that you care about them is by referencing and acknowledging their relationship with your organization right in your letters. This is something that we call segmentation. Um, I say that only a little sarcastically because strangely enough, lots of organizations do zero segmentation. All their donors get exactly the same appeal, and that's a monumental error. Don't send all of your donors the exact same letter. Segment your donor list and use variable copy in your appeals. So if they are a brand new donor, you know, say welcome. If they're a monthly donor, just say, thanks for being a monthly donor and you're amazing. If they're a lapsed donor, just say, we miss you. Really simple things. Um, this is another example. Every single appeal letter that we do, we always include a photograph of a Leonard Cider. And I remember Jeff Brooks, you guys probably know Jeff Brooks um, from the Seattle area, I believe Jeff's in Seattle. You know, Jeff said to me one time, did you guys ever test including the photograph of the letter signer on every letter? And I said, no, we never we never tested, but in the context of donor love, in the context of you know your donor wanting to have a human connection with these people who are asking them for something important, why would I test it? You probably couldn't prove it, but people want to give to people. That's a natural truth about our work. And so when your donor flips the letter over to read the PS, when they see a smiling human face there, they now can actually visualize the person who's talking to them. Again, there's a human connection there that they didn't have a second ago. It's very simple, so please start doing this on your appeal letters if you can. I could go on and on and on about these thousand small things, um, but I know that you all have other things to do today other than listen to me talk through them all. But do you see a trend in all these things? All of them are small, and again, mostly human things that add up to a unique and personal experience for your donor. And that's a part of our job. You know, our, part, our job is to meet our donors where they are and give them unique and human experiences. We shouldn't always expect them to come to us and just hand over the money. We have to do a better job of this stuff. And finally, principle eight, you say thanks with passion. 
thanks is basically this. You're basically looking at Dale, your donor, eyeball to eyeball. You're acknowledging her. And you know, even in your real life, you have instances where this happens to you, your local coffee shop, the restaurant down at the corner, wherever it might be, where there are people who acknowledge you, who know who you are, who know what you like. And that makes you feel amazing just for a brief moment, but so powerful. And our thinking does this for that for our donors. It says, I see you. It says you're important to me. It says you're good and I value you and thank you so much. Tom Ahern always says, you know, your job as a fundraiser is to make me, the donor, feel proud of myself, important, surprised, entertained, needed. So I want to show you um, a final couple of examples of how one charity I love very much, how they make me feel. And this is from the Redwood, and the Redwood is a small but very mighty charity that helps women and children escape from domestic violence. And when it comes to gratitude, when it comes to thanking donors, they do this extremely well. This is a small collection of, and I, when I say small collection, I probably have about five times this amount now, of letters and love they've sent to me over the years. It's important to know it's not just your ED's responsibility to thank. It's not necessarily the director of development or someone in gift processing. Every single person at your organization can and should have a hand in gratitude towards your donors. Hello, John. This is Anthea Windsor, president of the board at the Redwood. Having just learned that you gave such a generous gift to our summer e campaign, and really, given all the work you did um, with well, I think you are the agent of the good, aren't you? And I wonder why and your thoughts and being such a loyal donor. I just thought I would wish you a happy long weekend and uh, thank you for making it better for um, folks at the Redwood. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Even members of your board should have a hand in gratitude and love. In fact, there's studies that have been done that show that the members of the board are probably the best people to be calling and thanking donors. And sometimes, just like this call, it can be unscripted. This came on a Friday of a long weekend, and I could tell this one did not prep at all for this call, but it meant nothing to me. I and mean, I really appreciate it, it's beautiful. And it can be totally awkward. Gratitude should be a bit awkward at times. It can also be handmade or fresh off a laser printer. It can come random, you know, on certain holidays maybe. Sometimes, or maybe most of the time, it's a little bit cheesy. Donors love cheesy things, especially when considering who we're talking about here. These are th simple things you can send to your donor that have massive, massive impact because this is what love in your real life is like, and we know it. And this is what loving your donor is like too. This piece um, was a 17 by 11 piece that totally, and when I received it, totally openly made me bawl my eyes out. And still, when I look at it uh, too closely, I, get, I can get a little choked up about it, but it's beautiful. All of the windows and doors have notes from different staff and different women at the organization to me, telling me how amazing I am as a donor. This is absolutely stunning and beautiful. And can you, again, can you do this for every single donor? Absolutely not, you cannot. But there are some donors you know that you're thinking of this very moment that you know you can do better with. You know you can do a better job at having conversations with them. Here's another example of gratitude. Thank you. 
this was a thank you video we did for Habitat for Humanity of Waterloo uh, here in Ontario. And uh, it was for the donors. They were actually having an event, a gratitude event for donors. And they basically showed this piece off at the very beginning. Uh, it was being held in a big theater um, just up the road from here. And uh, it's it was a very simple piece that, again, donors, you know, you can see the impact of your giving in a different way than you're used to. Um, very simple and very high impact. So as I sort of ran through today, you know, again, these are the principles that I think people should be thinking about in the context of their own work, in the context of annual giving and legacy giving, that your donors are our heroes. They really are doing amazing things for us. You connect, you connect to their values and their emotions. You know, our job is to share these amazing, inspiring stories that happen around us every single day. And let's not forget, this is a relationship. It is a courtship. It's a romance. How do you make your donor fall and stay in love with you? You ask for one thing and only one thing. And ask yourself who or what is the right voice for your story. Let's never forget that donor love is all of the small things and it really is all of the time. And you say thanks with passion. Donor love is a conversation from one human to another. And it's emotional and it's messy and it's real, just like real life. Ask with thoughtfulness. Thank with love and always remind your donor how much you need them and appreciate the amazing work they make possible. Share these amazing stories that happen around you every day, but measure what matters most, which is your beautiful donor. And please, my friends, always do your work with love. And if you don't, then maybe it's time to move on, but please try to try to do your work with love. Thank you so much for the people who have actually stuck in on this webinar for the for most of the hour, um, or if you're listening later on down the road, um, thank you for having a listen. I'm always available on Twitter at John Lepp. Um, I'm on Twitter probably far too much. Uh, you can also email me anytime. I'm always happy to have chats with people and hear about the things you're doing at your organization. So feel free to get in touch um, anytime. And uh, thanks for QGIF for having me today. Yeah, always. Um, we get really excited about donor love here at QGIVE, and um, because it so closely affects legacy fundraising, which is something we don't do, it's really fascinating to have someone come in who can kind of speak to both both parts and how one kind of feeds into the other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions for you. Um, at the beginning of the webinar, you talked about identifying core values that a nonprofit shares with their donors and then communicating those values um, to them in appeals and in thank yous and in updates. Is there a resource or a way you can encourage nonprofits to do that? Maybe if the board sat down together or the development department decided to do it as an exercise? Um, it's a really good question. I mean, it's certainly some work we do with organizations because I've yet to meet an organization that says, you know, what we do is simple. It's so straightforward. I mean, everyone these days is so, so complex um, that they've, we've sort of lost, lost it, right? We can't see the forest for the trees. And so that's what we try to come and bring it back to that idea of think about that moment 24 hours before you were founded. That exists somewhere. Somewhere that's recorded and written down. And why did these people start this organization? And in that time phrase or phase that's where you're going to find some of these core values you know like again but i think we get so wrapped up in like we don't want to well that's too specific or that's too limiting it's not at all because most of your donors in fact if you don't know ask your donors they'll tell you what the core values are because they're the same as theirs do you know what i mean like that's why they give to you in the first place so you don't have to hire a fancy pants consultant agency to tell you how to do this stuff but you have to do a little thinking about well who were we who were we when we started why did we why did we get created? Why are we here? And you'll find a lot of your core values right in that in that space. Well, that's really interesting advice, and it kind of segues into another question that I had for you. You talked a lot about um, inviting your donors to have kind of back and forth conversations with you, whether it's um, someone maybe answering the question about the core values that they believe they share with your organization or someone who's sending you letters full of hummingbird puns or, or something yeah. along those lines. Um, yeah. We saw a lot of examples about how to do that in direct mail format. And we also know that people are increasingly looking to digital formats to learn about 
both annual funds and legacy funds. And I was wondering if there is a way that you suggest uh, that to facilitate kind of that back and forth language on a digital format. Well, I mean, again, we're a lot of us. I mean, I'm I'm pretty active on Twitter. I rarely ever see any organization have a meaningful interaction with people, their followers. It's very much a blast. Yeah last function, even with, again, I showed the website from Rethink, you know, when you click through the Facebook ad, there was an opportunity for the donors to express something about why mental health is important to them. It's not a very tough answer to a uh, question to answer. And that's the whole point of these things. You give simple, simple questions that people can emotively react to and answer, not something complicated about solving the earth's problems. And you can do that anywhere. But again, these days, there's, you know, this is the old joke that, you know, 20 years ago, if I rocked into your organization and told you I'd give you a free tool that allows you to talk to and have a conversation with every single one of your customers, clients, donors, whoever they would be, you would have given me millions. And yet we have these tools and yet no one does them. I don't understand, I don't understand why, why, I don't know what the function is. I don't know who's getting in the way of these, having these conversations, but our donors are talking to us and they're talking about us. And from what I see, we're not, we're just not listening or we just don't seem to care. So I, I don't have any, uh, that's the easy answer for me, which is they're there already. Just start talking to them or create space where they can share things with you. It's not, it's not really that difficult. I don't think. Absolutely. I love it. Um, thank you so much for coming by and, and talking to us. Um, we're right at three, and I feel like this is a topic I could talk about forever. I know it's a topic you could talk about for a long time, but um, everyone, I wanted to tell you thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I hope you got a ton of awesome examples and ideas. Uh, I will send you a link to the Sophie organization and a link to some of the examples that John used in his presentation in our follow-up email. Um, if you do have any questions about um, John's work and what the work that the Agents of Good do, please go check out their website. And if I know that I see a few QDF clients on here, if you have any questions about how we can help you apply some of these concepts to your account, let me know and I'll get you in touch with the right person. Um, but everyone, thank you so much for spending an hour learning to become a better fundraiser. We really appreciate it. And uh, we will talk to you all very soon. Thank you all very much. Thanks, everyone.